Welcome to the show. It's me, John Park, and it's time for John Park's workshop. I think we just got the stream going. The uh, YouTube was taking its sweet time getting going, but I think it's now streaming. I see, uh, I see signs of life over there. Uh, and thanks for stopping by. Thank you, uh, everyone over in the chat on YouTube, as well as here in Discord. Checking you both out. And uh, let me know if you have any questions today, any thoughts, any things you'd like to see. Coming up, uh, this is a interactive show, as you know. I sometimes feel like you're all just right there, and we're having a uh, little chat. I'm getting to show you cool stuff. Uh, so thank you so much for, for coming to the show. Uh, let's see. What have we got? First up, uh, I'd like to mention that we have got a jobs board over at jobs.adafruit.com. If you are looking for work, you might want to head there. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. There we go. Sorry. Uh, my previews made it look like this window was definitely not going to show up, but it showed up. Uh, sometimes the streaming software gets silly. So here on jobs.adafruit.com, you see there's a list of open positions people are looking to hire for. So you can uh, go and check that out. If you're into building sheet metal enclosures in CAD, then you may have uh, some contract work there in Brantford, Connecticut. Go, go to jobs.adafruit.com, check it out. You can click on this... Uh, little job description here and find out more about what someone's looking for. And that's free to post a position if you're looking to hire someone. And it's free to uh, click and put your resume up there. It's really easy to do. All you need to do is enter an email address. And guess what? Adafruit promises not to spam you. So this is uh, just your regular Adafruit account address. Lets you use the jobs board and we're never going to bug you. You can use it or not. It's up to you. So that's jobs.adafruit.com. And uh, let's see, what next? Close that window there so I don't get confused. Uh, it's easy to get confused, did you know? Let's see, uh, what else is going on? I've got a show on Tuesdays uh, that I'd like to mention, and that is my product pick of the week show. I do it every Tuesday at this time right here. So this is one o'clock Pacific time, where I'm at here in Southern California. It's Eastern time, four o'clock and it's your time based on some math that can happen wherever o'clock you are. And uh, if you take a look on Tuesdays at that show, you can watch the show from inside a product page. My video is right in there. And you usually get a big, big juicy discount on whatever the product is. So uh, it's worth trying to check it out at that time if you can. If you can't, I understand. But the, uh, the product this week, was this one right here. It's the Neo Key 2 Featherwing. And in fact, we're gonna be talking about that one a little bit more today. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you a little excerpt. Here's a one minute edit from this week's episode. Take it away, me. It is the Neo Key 2 Featherwing. And it is a Featherwing for adding two mechanical key switches to a feather project, and it has underlit NeoPixels. I've got this feather, this is the RP2040. Then I have a feather OLED. What you'll see here is when I press these, I am triggering a different illustration over here of this little bongo cat. This works as kind of a neat little macro key camera switcher right there. Uh, and I get my little bongo cat to bing, 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 bing. That is my product pick of the week. It is the Neo Key 2 Featherwing. It is a mechanical key switch Featherwing with underlit NeoPixels. That's right, bink, 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 Bongo Cat. Uh, by the way, as you know, I've been diving deep into mechanical keyboards, as have a lot of us here at Adafruit. Some people have been into this stuff way longer, like our, our good friend Colin Cunningham. The guy was born with a mechanical key switch in his hand. Huh, not sure how that works. Uh, 
But if you're, if you're digging this stuff and you want to dive a little deeper, uh, you will see a lot of my inspiration comes from amazing stuff that people in the mechanical keyboard community are posting over on the Reddit slash R slash mechanical keyboard, sometimes uh, abbreviated as RMK. And uh, that is where I saw that Bongo Cat idea. Uh, someone used, uh, I think it was the QMK firmware and made a little animated Bongo Cat that changes its typing speed uh, as you type, as you increase your typing speed. So uh, hats off, I wanna give credit where credit's due. I, I uh, think we'll probably do a post about that so you can see the original if you're looking for a link. Um, and in fact, I'll talk about this subject a little more today because my project is, was originally inspired by a, a particular uh, project I saw on, on our mechanical keyboards. Uh, now I'm changing it and I'll tell you why. Um, see what you think about that. But before I do that, uh, what have we got next? How about we jump into the CircuitPython Parsec, huh? Yeah. Okay, let me put on these glasses so I can, hey, I can see, I can read. Uh, that's close, but it looks like I got the wrong, <laughs> all right, hang on. I had a plan, there's the plan. Yeah, okay. Are you ready? For the Circuit Python Parsec today, I wanna to talk about debouncer. What's a debouncer? A debouncer is a piece of software used to prevent mechanical buttons and switches from rapidly registering multiple clicks when you touch them. There can also be physical debouncers or, or uh, circuit debouncers, but what I'm going to talk about is a software debouncer. And the way this works is that you will see, I've got a little uh, setup here, a little demo. This blue switch on the left is using no debouncer. This is going to be just traditional. The microcontroller, the Metro in this case, is going to read whenever I click and it's going to advance this NeoPixel, this blue NeoPixel, by one each time I click. And you'll notice I can't click it just once. Every time, even if I click it real fast, it jumps two, three times. And that's because it's reading my uh, hold or pause on that quickly enough that it runs through, or sometimes it'll even just read sort of the uh, arcing static of the contact getting closed. So those are both um, sort of solved by using this debouncer. And you can write your own debouncer, but we have a really neat uh, library for this in CircuitPython. And this is called Adafruit Debouncer. And you'll notice this yellow button on the right, this one's using the debouncer. So that means I can very nicely and neatly and gently click one at a time through these NeoPixels. It's really hard to get this blue one where I want, uh, but the yellow one is really easy, and that's because that one's using the debouncer. If you look at the code here, you can see I'm importing the digital I.O. library, uh, digital input and direction and pull, and I'm gonna use those, uh, as well as the debouncer library. And then you can see if I jump down to how I'm setting up the buttons here, Right here, we'll see the blue button is just a traditional digital in out, and I'm using with a pull up resistor. The yellow one, I set that input pin, but then I use the debouncer to set up this button. Yellow is debouncer on that pin that we've set up the same way. When we go to read those pins, the blue one is read in sort of a traditional way. Uh, if the value, since it's pull up, if the value goes to zero, it starts at one. When I press it, it goes to zero. If that changes, then we increase this count. You can see I've got a little counter down at the bottom there. Uh, let me, let me uh, set that up actually. Hold on one second. That got disconnected. Oh, I have multiple. <laughs> I have multiple things on here. Well, I think it's this first one. Let's see, six, are you it? Nope, all right, hold on. It's the other one. Do, do, do. I don't have everything set up with the new uh, magic that fixes that problem. Okay, there we go. So you can see here, when I press the blue button, it's going to rapidly count through, and I have it cycling zero through seven. Uh, I can, it's very hard to get it to just add one to that. Yellow one, 
that's easy. You also notice when I press and release the yellow, I get a, a sort of different event when I release. Okay, so you can see the, the blue one is set up so that it reads the button. If the value goes from high to low, we add one to that count, we print what the count is, and then we change uh, the uh, associated NeoPixel in the strip to be blue. On the yellow button, we have instead the debouncer update, so button yellow dot update right here checks the debouncer, so it's polling to see if something happens. And then this is the condition for me pressing it, the value falls, so it goes from zero to one, or high voltage to low voltage. Uh, that means I've pressed it. It's a sort of discrete event, so it means we don't get that bouncing, we don't register multiple clicks, and it doesn't matter how long I hold it. Uh, same thing here, I'm gonna add one to the count, I'm gonna print that count out, and then I'm going to uh, increase the NeoPixel on that strip. I'm also lighting up these little red NeoPixels on the board you can see there. Uh, this then, when the button goes back up from low to high, it is a separate event, so that means I can also record that. And so that is really useful. There's other stuff you can use the debouncer for, but I think this one's particularly helpful. It makes your code really neat. You don't have to create any states that you're checking against. Uh, it kind of tidies up a bunch of code for you uh, all inside of this one library. And so that is how you can use the Adafruit debouncer. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. All right, uh, we had a couple of questions I wanted to get to actually in the chat, and maybe some of you can help me answer them. Uh, let's see, Rich Sadowski over on YouTube says, have you ever worked with Laura? I just bought two units from Adafruit looking for online info, a CircuitPython user. Uh, so Rich, I've used the Laura uh, Featherwings and uh, only in Arduino. I have not used those in CircuitPython. I'm not sure what the state of libraries is there. I've used the... Uh, gosh, what's the library in Arduino? It's the one most people use. It's called something Airheads, something Heads, someone's head. Uh, <laughs> I forget now, it's been a while. If you look in the Learn, Learn system, uh, this is where I keep most of my memories. If you go to learn.adafruit.com and uh, look for uh, the uh, remote control, in fact, it's the first guide that shows up if you type in my name, John Park, in the... Um, uh, in the Learn Guides search bar, uh, there's a project there, and I used the um, Radiohead. I think that's it. Radiohead? Radioheads? Something like that. I think Stuart is, is onto it. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has used it in CircuitPython, let me know. I'm just not sure if there's a library yet for it. Uh, but the LoRa radios are great because it lets you do some really uh, excellent long-range stuff with, uh, with small bits of data. Uh, let's see. Other questions I saw... Um, do, do, do. Can you debounce cap touch pads? Dexter Starboard asks. Uh, I have not tried that. I think you can. I think I've used an example code that was debouncing them. Um, I don't see why not. So someone, someone let me know because uh, the way it's set up, it's generalized enough that I think you should be able to use CapTouch. So let me know if anyone's done that. Uh, I think Todd Kurt might have, our good friend Todd Bot might have done that in the past. Uh, let's see. There was one other question. Uh, doctor says, why do your USB serial devices have a percent sign at the end? I actually don't know. Uh, that's in reference to um, this here when I... Uh, when I try to connect. I guess that's uh, just my prompt. It might just be my terminal prompt. Uh, they changed a couple of versions of, ago. I'm using a, a Mac OS and they changed the prompt. I think that's why. Uh, doctor says their Mac doesn't do that. Yeah, hey, hmm, weird. This is another one. I'm going to have to go to the, the crowd for an answer. Um, Let's see. Can you do basic switch with the LoRa? 
you know what? I can bring up the Discord, actually, while I'm answering Discord. Hey, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a picture of the... Um, thank you, Mr. Certainly. That's a picture of the guide I was thinking of, the remote effects tr trigger uh, box. This uses uh, something really close to LoRa. It's the... Uh, gosh, I forget the name of it now, even. It's a, it's a very similar protocol. Um, and I think it uses the same library, the, the radio head library, if that was, that was called. Uh, and Stuart asks, can you use, uh, can you do basic switch with the LoRa? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I was using it for. So uh, one of my examples, I think there was an episode I did of this show around the time of that guide. Uh, you might be able to look that up, uh, where I just did a remote switch. I had a, a, a AC uh, relay controlled by uh, a feather, a remote feather. So. Um, and this, this project actually ended up building that for uh, stage effects for a magician, and it uh, did some control of some uh, stepper motors and things like that for effects. Uh, let's see. Other questions? Uh, someone asked about the NeoPixel part that I'm using, and that may be related to the giant keycap. So I will talk about that. I'm going to do a little update on that. Um, in fact, let's jump to that right now. Let me uh, head over to the bench. And I'll give you a little, I wanted to do a little bit of update on this rage quit button uh, that I was working on, whoops, last week. I almost yanked my microphone off. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it looks like that's still working. Um, so this is the current state of this giant switch. Uh, and if I pull that key cap off, you'll see that there's a, focus this, whoa, you can do it. You can see there's a large LED there, and this one is a uh, NeoPixel. Um, do I have, <laughs> I don't have an extension, I'm not going to be able to plug that in to that. Is this live? Let me grab a battery pack real quick so you can see this. Got a kind of short cable in there. Let's see if one of these battery packs will work. Are you charged? I think that one needs charging. How about you? There we go. Uh, so, not too useful as a HID device right now because it's not plugged into anything. Um, but this is a, uh, oh, it's not going to work because it's not, it might not work because it's not actually plugged into HID. Let's see. All right, I'm going to bring this back over to the computer. Hold on. Uh, or, yeah, let's do that. Let's see. Sorry about that. Got too many things plugged in over here. All right, so let's take this demo down. Uh, oh, and actually, before I before I take that down, I think the question might have been about the the a different NeoPixel. So many of them. Uh, these right here are what I was using. So I just had a piece of this diffusion plastic over it. But the uh, the demo here, which I've now also broken. There we go. Uh, it's just hard to see those little. NeoPixels uh, without some diffusion, so that's why I put that there. But these are the, I like these, these are little eight position, uh, eight NeoPixel switches, and then I just have them uh, plugged into two different pins so I can control them separately. Uh, so that's what those are, those are great. All right, so let's take this off and let's, uh, let's go over there. There's a lot of blue tack to keep this stuff from sliding around. That's a little behind the scenes tip, <laughs> is that most everything you ever see photographed or demoed has some blue tack on it, otherwise things slide around too much. Uh, so, let's see if I can, there we go, yeah. Um, so sometimes with if you're using HID and serial stuff, sometimes you can't battery power a thing because the, the code is like, I can't connect to serial, I can't send HID, so I'm not going to work. Um, so this is a, uh, let me focus this one too, actually. There we go. Uh, so this is a 
uh, through hole, four leg, eight millimeter diffused NeoPixel. And then I have it plugged into just a little piece of header, uh, a little header breakout and then wire soldered to it. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit janky there. And then I have some uh, heat shrink over those connectors there so nothing's exposed. Um, that still clears the cap, which is what I wanted. I needed it to be uh, small enough that this cap wouldn't uh, collide with it. And so that's the demo of the LED there. But actually, one of the things I wanted to talk about, uh, actually a couple things that I'm uh, going to show you today have to do with the design process here of a couple of different cases. So uh, this one here, I'm going to zoom back out so you can see kind of the iterations this one went through. Then we'll get to some of this other stuff. Um, so when I first uh, got this switch, I just wanted it to be able to stand on its own because what you'll see is this, this thing is great and it acts just like a, uh, a mechanical key switch in that it's just a lot stronger, so it's hard to pop it out without some spudgers in there. Let me lift that off of there and that off of there. There we go. Uh, oops, sorry. So that has um, a fairly accurate to real life of a real switch. Uh, you can see the bottom has a little nub plastic nub that goes th and registers through the board and there's a couple of uh, pins or legs there for the switch itself and that means that this thing just can't really sit on its own it just flops over um, so the first thing I did was really quick to print a uh, little almost looks like a table from a box of pizza except not three-legged um, but it clicked into there and I just didn't love the way it looked it works fine uh, it's a little light, skits around a little bit, and not a lot of space to put um, bumper feet on there. So, so that was iteration one. Uh, the next one I did, I just kind of beefed it up a bit, made things thicker. You can see I've got some little indents there where the um, clamps or, or spring-loaded uh, clicky thingers, I'm sure there's a better name for that, uh, click into place there. And... Then I decided for some reason I wanted to make the, this a little thinner on top. I printed it out. I didn't like it. <laughs> I beefed things back up. Got this one nice and beefy here. Um, and then I was printing one iteration of this and I stopped it. For some reason I can't remember. but. Where I stopped it made me think of, of something, which is I could kind of combine these two ideas and end up with uh, kind of a nice frame there. I kind of like that shape and that tilt. Um, before I did that, I printed a solid one uh, with no openings in the sides. And that one's nice, but it's hard to kind of see the cool switch. And, and, I, and I missed seeing it when it was in there. Um, so ultimately, I took this idea and I made this a proper model, and then I created some pegs and holes uh, so that this could be separated like that uh, and printed more easily, because otherwise that'd be kind of a nightmare thing to print. Uh, so you can see here, these are printed uh, in that orientation. So there's actually no overhangs, uh, prints pretty nicely. Uh, and then on this, if I, let's see if I can get it close up. focus. You can see I've got a little bit of space here. Uh, you see that blue behind there. I've got a little bit of space behind uh, there so that I can put a little glue in there. And oh, that one's actually cracked a little. I've opened. <laughs> I've done it too many times. Uh, put a little bit of glue in there. A little bit of CA glue will work well. Uh, and if these are a little thicker than the holes, they'll squeeze in and then I can push that down into place like that. Uh, I didn't want to have screws going through here because that's just another thing to deal with and you'd have a hole there. So, uh, so that's my final design for that and I think that uh, works pretty well for holding that giant switch. Um, so let me see, I'm, I'm seeing some 
some messages pop up over on the workstation. So I'm going to jump back here for a moment and see what's what. Usually my fear being people are saying, we can't hear you. Um, yeah, Mr. Certainly says, I wish these switches were still in stock. They are hard to find. Um, I think if, you know, hopefully they'll, if you, if you send them a, a note, it's novel keys. And if you send them a note, if enough people do, then it will make sense for them to, uh, to rebuild those novel switches, big switches. Uh, Todd says, let me pop up my Discord, that the percent in the dev TTY file list is done in Linux Mac OS to indicate a special file, in this case, a device driver. Ah, okay. Um, there you go. And <laughs> Todd says, where are you going to get the rest of the key switches to make a 65% keyboard? out of those big keys. Did I show you all that? So, uh, Razer, the, the company that makes PC gaming peripherals, they did build one using those switches. Uh, they contracted a special edition of those with green stems, because that's the color Razer uses for their logos and things. And they made a, it was at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, I think they made a gigantor uh, BFK, big freaking keyboard. Uh, all right, so, um, now, what I want to talk about is moving on to uh, a different keyboard project than the, than the big key. So let me move some of this stuff out of the way. Um, and this, you may have seen me tease this online a little bit, and I showed it on uh, the Ask an Engineer, or uh, Show and Tell the other day. And what this, what I showed, what you, what you probably saw, if you saw it, was the um, 2% keyboard. So if you don't know, a sort of standard 104 key keyboard, I think that's what a standard is, uh, with a number pad and a function key row and home and page up and, and that. Uh, that, roughly that number, I might be off on that, that's kind of considered a 100% keyboard. And then there are smaller percentages than that. You can make anything you want, but some standards include a 60%, which is pretty darn small. It gets rid of the number keys. Uh, it gets rid of the arrow keys. It gets rid of the row of function keys. And a lot of things happen with key combos. So for example, you can get the function keys by holding function and numbers uh, one through zero at the top and so on. Uh, there are 70%, I think that's what a 10 key list might be, 70 or 80%. Uh, I like those a lot. But uh, so someone came up with the idea of a two key macro pad, we'll call it a 2%. It might not be 100% uh, accurate, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but the idea of it being 2% led to the idea of it being a milk carton. And in fact, I wanna jump to this uh, webpage. I may have shown this before, so, so sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I think it's, it's interesting and neat to look at. Uh, so I'm gonna pop open a browser in a second and uh, show you this site here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, let's do that one. Uh, so this one here was uh, created by Keyhive, and uh, it's a there's a PCB for it that has a uh, I don't know probably a 32U4 on there, and it's running QMK I think. Uh, so it's all all in one uh, the, the the microcontroller USB all of that I think is on a single board, so it's nice and small, which is cool, and it goes into these adorable uh, milk carton 3D prints. Uh, so I mistakenly thought that this was kind of an open design that was out there and, and people were making them like on Thingiverse or whatever. So I decided, hey, I'm going to make my own. I did, I, I did a little bit more research and I think this is one company's product. So I am not going to release this file out there. I don't want to be the jerk who's like, hey, cool, I'm just going to rip off your thing. So I'm um, sorry about the confusion there. So I, I had gone down this path of, of building this and then uh, I decided to change directions on it. So if you want to make one of those, go ahead and buy uh, this from, from uh, keyhive.xyz, or model your own to put a different thing in it, but I, I don't want to release a file of that because it seems uh, like not the right thing to do. If you have opinions about that, you can put them in the chat and, and talk about them, but uh, that's what I decided to do. And so I wanted to shift my, uh, my design direction a little bit. Um, and so going based on, on what I had already, I'm going to, uh, let me bring up a different view here. Uh, I'm going to show you. So this is cutting right to the chase. So this is the design that I came up with. Um, and it is, 
similar, of course. It's a it's a two key. I mean, that feather wing having two keys on it uh, already is pretty similar. Uh, let me see if I can show you the the guts of that. Uh, let me hide these. Uh oh, my right clicking is not cooperating. I wonder if that's because it's off on a second screen. Oh, there it goes. Uh, okay, so you can see. Does it work? Oh yeah, this does not want to work when it's on my on my other screen. I think it might be missing the mouse clicks. All right. Uh, so this is this is the uh, feather wing. Uh, I've got one right here. This is our lovely little feather wing that has two um, hot swappable sockets for mechanical key switches in there. There it is stacked on top of a feather, and so you can see that this is this is naturally going to fit this type of a of a case design. Uh, so I didn't think I needed to stray too far from that. Um, and then if you, uh, if you take a look at what I've done here, I've gone with more of a uh, sort of an art deco or streamline modern type of design. And uh, let me render this. And so I've essentially rounded the, uh, the corners there. Um, one thing that I'm happy about changing from the milk carton design is that I now have a sort of reasonable space to put a Stemma QT cable. Um, so if you look down that little uh, cutout there, you've got a four pin I squared C Stemma QT cable, one of these little lovely guys right here. And so uh, that can be fed into the case. It's hard to get it in and out. Actually, it's hard to get it in if you've already got everything built, but uh, you might be able to do it with some, uh, some long needle nose pliers maybe. Uh, but that allows us to have kind of any I squared C device that you need plugged in. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be an integrated part of the case, but if you just have to get this connected to whatever you need to get it connected to, an external screen or something like that. Um, now, I, now I have a nice port for that. I didn't really want to put a hole in the milk carton. Uh, and then I've made a few iterations of it. I'll show you some of the iterations of the milk carton that led to this. Uh, this is I've just printed one of this one. Uh, this morning, and I have not really even put it together yet. So we're going to get to do that uh, in a live demo, which is very advisable. That's how everything should be done. Or maybe not. I don't know, but we'll find out. Uh, so you can see I've got a large cutout for USB cable here, and that allows me to accommodate a lot of different um, sizes of cables. If you have one specific cable in mind, and I really like these fabric uh, pink and purple ones, that uh, this, is, this is a USB micro B connection on this particular feather I'm using. Uh, I have the NRF52840 feather on here. I may switch this to a Pico, and in which case it would be a USB-C cable, but again, it's, uh, it, you can usually get a fairly slim design in there. So that hole is bigger than it needs to be. It'll, it'll accommodate kind of a larger cable. Um, and then uh, if, I, if I show you actually some of, some of what led to this, let's go over to this uh, workbench again. And my, uh, my thought process on this was originally to build a switch plate. I'm going to have to zoom and focus here. There we go. Uh, so this is the little plate that holds the key switches in place. So if you take a couple of key switches and put them into our uh, socketed connector here, they can wobble pretty easily. So when you have a key cap on there and you press that, let's get that on nicely. Uh, you press that straight up and down, it works great. If you come at it from a little bit of angle, it's got some wobble and it can actually pop right, right on out. Um, so by putting a switch plate, the two, the lateral um, stability is improved. And so the way those work is that they sit between the key and the socketed uh, PCB. So this clicks into here like that. And we'll take a second switch. Like 
that. And then these go connecting into our sockets on the PCB. And now you get uh, kind of improved lateral stability. By the way, you're gonna see a flashing light because there's some sunlight coming through a little uh, vent fan on the top of the shop. Uh, so that was my first idea is I wanted to create this switch plate and it works really well. I've, I've added one to a different, my little uh, Bongo Cat macro pad that I was showing the other day. Um, but this, this uh, I originally was like, hey, I should probably print this in multiple parts so that I can feed it all in from the top and then have some little spot for bumpers on the bottom or some screws to come up through and connect to the feather. So if you see here, I've got a feather, I've got the feather wing on top, I can drop that all down into there. Then I can set this um, onto here, kind of click that down carefully so you don't bend the pins. You want to make sure you got those in there well and then I can push the whole thing back down and then maybe secure it with a screw straight through there. Um, so that works pretty well but it is a little bit more to put together but I, I kept thinking that I wasn't going to be able to um, print it all in one go if I had this type of design going. If I had um, sort of an inner piece there it seemed like I, it wouldn't work so well. Uh, another thing I, I didn't really love how high this was off of the top of the case, especially with some of my earlier designs. Um, oh, I don't have one here, but they were a little shallower before. And with some bigger keycaps, like these uh, big kitty paw keycaps. Oops. Let me pull that focus up a little bit. There we go. Uh, it's kind of goofy. It's kind of way too high up off of there. So I just, just as a quick fix, I designed a little um, something or other to, to kind of fill that gap there, but then it was looking less and less like a milk carton. Um, but if I, if I made the whole case taller, it really lost the milk carton shape. So when I, when I ditched the milk carton entirely, um, I decided to also try integrating the switch plate right into it. Uh, and then I printed it with support and it still printed pretty quick. I just had some loose sort of Z-shaped or zigzag shaped support in here that I pulled out with some pliers. Um, and that allows me to feed the board in from the bottom like so. And then the switches go straight in uh, without worrying about uh, aligning the face plate. So what happens is these will click, since I've pushed the, the feather up a little extra, these will go into the um, quick connects without yet clicking into the face plate. Then I'll push the whole thing down and it, and it gets stopped by that face plate, which is great. It kind of clicks into that. So if you see here, we've got the two switches and I can I can feel that they've gone in nicely. I haven't bent those pins. Now I click this down. I'm gonna click, and now the switch is clicked into that plate. They're not going anywhere. This is tight enough uh, fit with the, the connectors that it's not going anywhere either. You could add like a little base if you wanted to or, or something else, uh, go back to the screw hole idea. But so far I found I don't need that. Um, and now we can add some, uh, some key switches. Uh, I think I wanted to try these little clear ones here. Those might look nice. So I'm going a little bit into the Art Deco uh, Miami colors a bit here with the white and, uh, and this tealish color, which I dig. And now, again, I, I mentioned I can plug that in. I have to do it before all this gets assembled, so that goes in first on its own. Um, and I can connect up our micro USB here. And now we have a nice little macro pad. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see, we can probably fire it up. I think this one will demo without a connection to a computer, the way I have it set up right now. And I just have some little ch color change going on here right now. Uh, this this uh, is not sending um, anything at the moment. I had This is the one I think I have set up to do BLE MIDI. 
Uh, I have a couple of these floating around. This one will do BLE MIDI. And uh, so for that, you may want to redesign something like this to incorporate a battery, but then you need an on-off switch. So I decided to forget all that. Uh, I did include a uh, space for the reset switch. So there's a, a right angle mounted reset switch on the side of that feather wing. Um, so you can press that with a little screwdriver or something like that, pen. And, uh, and that'll work like that. So I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna plug this into my machine. And I'm also, I'm hearing beeps and bloops, so I, I will check to make sure there aren't desperate messages coming from uh, Discord and other, other lands telling me that we've, we've, uh, we've got a problem. Let's see, it looks like nothing, uh, nothing bad. That's good. Uh, hey, AT Makers, Bill. Sorry you're late. No problem, welcome. Uh, so I'll plug this in right here. Let me go to the down. My little down camera. And I will give that a little bit of a focus. It is hard to focus on, on bright, bright lights coming at you. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and again, without some darkening and diffusion, it's really hard to see those colors, but there you have it. Uh, so that is the design. Uh, if, if we jump back over to uh, Rhino, the program I used to design this, you can see I added in, uh, just for decorative reasons, these uh, sort of ribs, kind of a streamlined modern uh, look that you get there from, from adding that to it. Like some of the buildings, if you look up Streamline Modern or Art Deco, you'll see some buildings that have this kind of a look. Um, AT Makers, Bill says that he's got a great use for this now with OBS Studio MIDI uh, as a controller plugin. So you can do like camera changes, layer changes, things like that. That's very cool. Um, I actually found, I was looking the other day for games that use a, uh, a two button controller scheme because this would be kind of fun for that. And I, I just found uh, there's a rhythm game from the late, I don't know, like 2007 or something like that. I'd never heard of it. It's called Osu or Osa. Osu? O-S-U? O-S-A. Osa, I think. Um, it's a rhythm game that just uses two buttons and I think a mouse or a pen to sort of change these curvy shapes and hit, hit uh, keys to the rhythm. So two button macro pads are apparently very popular for, for some rhythm games, which is, which is cool. Uh, and let's see, I'm just about ready to wrap up. So let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, Osu doctor says it's still around and I think pretty popular. There you go. Yeah. I bet Twitch streaming, uh, brought back some, some popularity for Osu. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see what other questions we have. Um, Someone asked about this acrylic I'm using. This is called LED plastic. It's acrylic that has a diffusion uh, matte finish, pebbled sort of textured matte finish on one side. It's shiny on the other, uh, and it works well for diffusing LEDs. It's used by sign makers for that type of thing. We sell it on, uh, on Adafruit in sheets about the size of a matrix portal because they look really good in front of a matrix portal. Uh, AT Maker Bill said the Xbox adaptive controller add-on peripheral uh, this would be good for that now that Cir CircuitPython will support it out of the box. Very cool. Uh, Rich Sadowski says, got to walk the dog, but thanks for the help today. You bet, Rich. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, and it looks like you found some LoRa code for CircuitPython. That's great. Tiny LoRa. Uh, go check that out. Also for the RFM 99X series. That's what I was using before. Uh, and good. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think that'll, that'll about do it. So thank you all so much for stopping by. Um, I will be, now that I've got a design that's uh, in, the, in the clear and I feel good about it, I'll be putting this together and uh, throwing this model or maybe I'll continue to refine it. Let me know if you have any ideas for refinements on this before I put it up. Uh, I could probably use a little more space on the bottom for, for a second um, foot so it doesn't slide around. There's some nice space here, but not so much here. So uh, if you have other ideas, let me know. Um, and 
I think the Ruiz brothers even agreed to do some beautiful stop motion photography of the 3D print, uh, some, some uh, time lapse, so that'll be cool. Doctor says, maybe a bottom cap to seal it up. That's a great idea, yeah, and if I add a, add a bottom to it, then we can have lots of space to put a, put a bumper on there. Uh, all right, so last thing before I go, let me get this out of the way, is uh, I will mention that Scott, our own tan newt Shawcroft, has his Scott's Deep Dive uh, in about 13 minutes or so. It's going to be at 5 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and I may be showing up on the show. He asked me if I'd be a guest on the show today. So I will uh, I'll try to head on over there and uh, see what we can, we can chat about. Always good stuff happening on the show there. So... Uh, that's going to do it. Thank you all so much for stopping by and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.